Okay, good morning. We're on page 148. Before we begin, that's chapter 53, the second to last page. We're going to dedicate today's class, Lilu Nishmat, Amelia Bat Yitzchak, and Chanabat Yechiel. Hashem should bless their Nishamot and bless their souls and bless the families. So we're coming to, uh, I guess, a certain pinnacle, a certain point where we're going to sort of conclude this whole message, the whole theme, the whole point. And the Alter Rebbe is now going to really bring everything from the Tanya together. He's going to sort of come, all the things that he's taught and he explained in the last 53 chapters is going to come together as a final point. So just to remind ourselves of some of what was discussed in the last chapters. After the Alter Rebbe begins Tanya with a series of questions, and he goes and introduces the animal soul and then the godly soul, and he explains the, the makeup of the soul and the struggle of the soul and the different roles of the soul, he focuses on the Benini. The Benini's job is to struggle with down-to-earth physical, meaning you're not going to change your spiritual identity necessarily, what you are, you are, but you could change what you do, your, your thought, your speech, and your action, that's in your control. And he goes on and explains that the ultimate is the physical actions. Now you might wonder why is physical action so important? Why is it such a big deal to do physical actions? It should be the ultimate, should be the spiritual connections, the, you know, the, the, the um, rich, meaningful experiences that are my heart, my mind, and my soul. Why is what I do so important? If I, if I touch together, you know, El Esrig and the Lola, if I light a candle, why is that such a big deal? And we went through explaining a number of points, but one of the primary points was and is that Hashem wanted a der b'dachtenim. He wanted physical actions in this world that will make this world a dwelling place for Hashem. That's only done through physical actions. As a matter of fact, we know one of the primary points of Chassidus, one of the great ideas in Teda, is what was accomplished at Matan Teda. There's a lot of discussion. What was the effect? What was the accomplishment of Matan Teda? Hashem gave the Torah Har Sinai. I mean, it was, on Simcha story we say, that um, Avram celebrated the Torah, Yitzchak celebrated the Torah, uh, Yaakov celebrated the Torah, Shvatim. I mean, Torah existed and we studied it and was studied. We say, what did Yaakov do before? In this week's portion, we read, Rashi says he spent 14 years first in the yeshiva of Aver. Shem had passed away, 14 years in the yeshiva of Aver. What was he studying? Torah. So Torah existed. I mean, all the times you have, it says, as a matter of fact, he was saying, Tillam, there's a whole discussion, which chapters of Tillam he said. So the fascinating thing is, so what happened at Matan Taita? And the answer is that there's different types of walls that separate things in the world. There are walls that you can get through, like the southern border, okay, whatever. There's walls that you can get through and walls you can't get through. There are some walls that no one can get through. One of them <laughs> is the wall between spirituality and physical material world. Until Matan Taita, there was a wall, the Zara says, like a king that said, no one from this country goes to this country and vice versa. You can't cross the border. You can't go through. And anything spiritual, not affected physical. That means when Avraham or Yitzchak or Yaakov studied Torah and tried to take and do a mitzvah, it was impossible to transform the physical world. If they did a mitzvah with something physical, it could be thrown into the garbage afterwards. It couldn't connect. Spiritual and physical could not connect. Man Torah was that Hashem empowered a Jew to change the world with Torah. You can affect the world. You could turn wine into Kiddush, a bread into challah. You could make a, a leather into tefillin, a, a parchment into mezuzah, or you could use a God forbid for not good things. You could, you could basically transform the world, lift up the world to make it holy. And that's the only through actions. It's the physical actions, which is why, by the way, on Shavuos, the day we celebrate the Torah, something very odd. There's a whole discussion in the Talmud, if on Yom Tif and on Shabbos, you have to eat food or you have to be spiritual. What's that about? Has to be Lashem, should it be a day of davening and a day of learning or a day of enjoying food and wine and meat and rest, etc. So there's a machlekes. But when it comes to Shavuos, everyone agrees you also have to have food. So the question is Shavuos of all days. If anything, Pesach was a physical success going out of Egypt. You know, uh, Sukkot, we were protected by Hashem from uh, the elements. Shavuos is celebrating Torah. That should be the one day it doesn't, you don't have to have food. And the answer is no. The Matan Torah is not celebrating Torah, it's celebrating Torah's impact in the physical world. And that is only done if you interact with the world and you are with the physical world, which is why, by the way, a Nazir who abstains from having wine and abstains from having um, interaction with the world, 
He has to bring a sin offering. Hashem gave you a chance to elevate wine, and you can't do it. Don't hold back from interacting with the world, unless, of course, it's a medical issue or a health issue, etc. But when you can interact with the world and eat foods, eat foods, make a blessing, serve Hashem, use the world out. That's why on Shavuos you specifically have a meal, and you have to eat a meal. Everyone agrees a meal on Shavuos, more than any other holiday. That's why today actions are so important. You have to do a mitzvah and impact and infiltrate and transform the physical world. After that, that al explains, but that's not enough. You have to have feelings too. And he went through a whole series of chapters explaining that it's not enough to do things in action. You have to also have the feelings, the love and fear and God, of God. And that he went into a whole explanation is the wings. He says, what's the, the mitzvah is the bird, the action. The wings are the love and the fear, the feelings, the kavana, and that takes the mitzvah to a place very high. Then what affects the physical world is the, is the actions. What lifts that up and how high it goes is the wings. So once you have the action, then you must also have the wings and you must lift it up. But the key is the action. What happened through all this? Something very incredible. And this is why it's important for the chapter we're getting to. What happened through this process of mountain teda was something incredible. Before Ma'an Teda, a Yid could connect to Hashem only through spiritual relationships. It wasn't some, I don't want to say magical, but it wasn't, it wasn't some um, gift that Hashem gave the world that you can connect to Him. It was that the highest part of a physical, or I don't want to say physical, the highest part of a created being could reach the lowest part of Hashem. And somewhere they could meet. The lowest part of Hashem, so to speak, lowest part, the lowest part of Hashem. And the highest part of a spiritual do the essence of your soul, if you get really spiritual, really mystical, you can connect and touch somewhere in the middle. What did Ma'an Torah do? Just the opposite. The highest part of God connects to the lowest part of us. Not that the lowest part of God connects to the highest part of us. Ma'an Torah, Hashem said, I'm coming down to the world. And my highest part, my essence, where am I found in the actions of the mitzvahs? And that's, that's found the lowest thing you do. Specifically, not enough to think about it, not only to talk about it, but even do something, make an action, a physical action, and invest in the physical world. And the result is not that the highest part of us reaches the lowest part of God, but the highest part of God touches the lowest part of us. As you mentioned last week on the Mime of this week's Parsha, that the ultimate goal of Yaakov, which represents the whole story mm. of Yaakov leaving Be'er Sheva and going to Choron, is the Shema coming down to this world. What was the ultimate goal of a Yetzir Yaakov and Be'er Sheva going out of Be'er Sheva? What's the Shavu? He said the first line in Tanya. Mashbiyam Isai. We make him swear that you're going to be a tzaddik, meaning birth. When the whole journey, why are you leaving with this burst of energy and influence and keiches you're given, is to go vayikach me'avne ha'mokim, take the stones of the place. What did Yaakov do? He took the stones. He made all the stones into one. As we know, in the, at night, he came as uh, multiple stones. Then it became one stone. And the morning, he makes it into a mezbeach. It makes it a bayis l'ashem, a bayis l'ashem. He takes the ultimate, the, the, what's the ultimate in, in lowness is not only when it's material, but when it's fragmented material. The worst, lowest part of the universe is not only when it's uh, physical, and that in physical itself, you have four levels. You have doimim, semeach, chayim, medaber. Doimim is inanimate, semeach is plant life, chay is animal kingdom, and medaber is human beings. The lowest of that is avonim, stones. And in that, the lowest is when the stones are fragmented, many stones. That is like in the world when you don't see the, the holistic oneness of the world and you see it all as a bunch of isolated details, unconnected. That's a, that's a sad point of how to see the world. It's really one beautiful organism Hashem created. So when you take first step is take all of the separate and make it into one and then take that one and make it into godliness, that's the ultimate. That's the purpose of creation, to go into the physical world and the same thing is in action. It's not, just, it's not enough to want and to think and to feel holy, but to actually go and be holy. The idea of absolute um, oneness with the lowest part of creation. The Rebbe once gave a metaphor that uh, that when you want to lift up a whole stack of something, or in the olden days, nowadays it's not done too often, homes are so big. But well, the old days, they'd move a home because they're like the side of trailer homes. They'd move it. The Rebbe explains they used to take a board called a lever, a lever, whatever, and stick it underneath. And then with the whole method, they'd turn it. How do you lift it up? You have to go to the lowest part after. If you want to lift up the entire house, you have to go to the lowest part that everything is lifted up. And that's why they dug under the house before they moved it. So he says, that's how it works with Yiddishkeit. You want to elevate the world, you have to go to the lowest part. That's the physical, material world. And over there, lift it up. So that's where we're getting to in Tanya here. We're getting to this last point of Hashem's investment and his coming down, the, the highest 
level of godliness. We said the Chachma, which is the Torah comes, we're talking about the Shechina, we're talking about its vessel that carries the Shechina, is Torah. We asked the question, if the vessel is supposed to conceal it, how is the Torah not burned, so to speak, by Shechina? And we said Torah really comes from a higher place. If it's from a higher place, so how is it not burn us? Meaning Torah is the vehicle that carries the Shechina into the world. That's why the Shechina rests in the Chachma, in the, in the Holy of Holies, in the Torah. Of each level, we said that we said the metaphor was the brain and the brain of each world. That's the chachma. That's what shechina rests in. The neshama rests in the brain. Shechina rests in Torah. If Torah comes from a higher place, why doesn't Torah burn us up? And the answer is because Torah has these two impossible extremes. And that's what we're up to here. Torah has on one hand, it is the highest of the high. At the same time, it comes in to the lowest physical world in its form without being modified. And we'll explain that right now. Good timing. We explained that Torah has a phenomenal, unique ability. And where is it seen? We spoke about this earlier in the Holy of Holies in the Kedj Shechadash. The fact that the Luchas didn't take up any space. At the same time, the Luchas had to be a specific size. The Luchas, Luchas had to be one and a half cubits by two and a half cubits or one and a half cubits. Nevertheless, it took up no space. It's impossible for the mind to grasp. The metaphor that we could use for this is something we spoke about in the Shabbos afternoon class, which became a good discussion, the idea of taking an elephant and putting it into the eye of a needle. Yeah. The only way to get an elephant through the eye of a needle is two ways to do it. You can shrink the elephant, make it really, really small, or get a really big needle. Hashem puts the elephant into the eye of the needle without changing either one of them. The elephant remains the elephant, and the eye of the needle remains the size of the eye of the needle, and it still goes through perfectly. Something the mind can't comprehend. It's impossible. But that's what happens, and that's Torah. Torah is on one hand, it is the highest source, the most elevated greatness comes from Reishud uh, Leis Yada, which means the top of Kesar, the highest point, and it comes down to the physical actions that some person, as we said a couple lines ago, Afilu Echal Yeshiv Eising a person is sitting and being involved in Torah. The Shechina is there, so we said, what does it say, Yeshiv, sitting? Sitting is an act of the least involvement. There's sometimes, you know, uh, could you get me there? Sitting means I'm in a lazy mood. Could you get me? You're two feet away. You can't get up. I'm in a zone of laziness when I'm sitting. That's how it is. It's a, at least I can tell you from experience. A lot of times, last of my kids will pass me something, and they're not even near the table. <laughs> I just, I'm not in the mood of getting up. Yeshiv means I'm not putting effort in. Even a simple study of Torah, a simple learning without major effort, is drawing down the highest levels of Kedusha into this world. And that's what we're discussing here. So we're going to go back a couple lines because there's some very beautiful points here that we can explain a little bit more than we did last time. So it's on page 148, the second last page of Tanya. Mm -hmm. And we're going to... Um, okay, we're basically about two-thirds down. A two-thirds? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because uh, well, maybe maybe three fifths down, we say kitayag mitzvah We're talking about the ultimate has to be the actions. We says we're talking about we're talking about here how Toyota is manifest and comes down through the different worlds. So we said, and how Toyota is in Atzilus, how Toyota is in the, the first base of Mikdash, how Toyota is the second base of Mikdash, and then we said, how is a Toyota? How is Shechina today? The Shechina rests in the Torah today, but it comes down in the first base of Mikdash, it came down to Malchus the Atzilus, and it jumped, we said it skipped all the uh, rest of the worlds, and it came into a way where you saw the impossible take place. The impossible was that the Luchais was the miracle taking place where all six sides of Luchais were carved out, and you saw the presence of God in the base of Mikdash unnatural. It was super seeding all the rules of nature. The second base of Mikdash, it came down a bit more. It came down to Malchus the Yetzirah, as it is manifest, as it lives in the Kedj Shekadashim of Yitzira, of, of, of Asiya, of Ruchnius. Very high level, again, but not the, not all the way down. Then, and not the highest. When it comes down, we said how Torah is in this uh, physical world, meaning after the base nation was destroyed, it comes down to Malchus da Asiya. And in Malchus da Asiya, we come to, which is with the world, everything we have, everything we have today, the cup of tea, those Cinnamon buns, everything comes from Malchus Asiya, the lowest. So what's the difference? So the difference is, we said earlier in Tanya, no, have soon. It's warm, it's warm still? Yes. Oh, I can't say no. 
All right. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Malach Elam Berminim Sinus. Wow. Hmm. You know what? They're hot chocolate buns. Oh. And see him also. This is drawing down holiness into the lowest. Oh, what's missing is um, dairy cream cheese topping, but whatever. <laughs> hmm. I can't say no. Okay. So Taylor comes down to this physical world and it's going through Machus de Asiya, which is the way everything is created, but everything is created in this world where it's concealed. What's the primary difference? The Alder said earlier, I think it was in chapter 35 or 36, around there. He says, in all things in this world, while it's true, it comes from Malchus Dacia, you don't see it. When you see a chocolate Danish or you see a cup of coffee, you don't see godliness. What you see is a cup of coffee. If you think about it, you could find a way to use it to serve Hashem. Okay. There are certain things, like in Torah, where it's clear. You see a mezuzah, you see godliness. You see a pair of fill, and you see godliness. You see a lighting shop as candles, godliness. I mean, within Torah, you could see, what does godliness mean? Godliness doesn't mean that I see an angel. I see some spiritual wispy cloud of, you know, um, some mystical stuff. It means I see God's purpose and God's plan and God's intention. When we say everything is godliness, we mean that could I see within this God's purpose of creating the glass cup and the tea, etc., or do I see it as just some thing that I could enjoy disconnected from God? So it's very easy to see it disconnected. Whereas in mitzvahs, you don't see it disconnected. You see it connected to Hashem. So the, all the other things in this world that come from Malchus Dasiya, you can't see godliness in it. And tell you that's revealed. But now I'm going to take it a little bit further. Kitayag mitzvah the 613 mitzvahs of the Teira, Rubat Gekulon, and Mitzvah Smaisius, are all talking about mitzvahs that have actions associated with it. Almost all of them. There are a few mitzvahs that don't have an action. For an example, to love Hashem, to fear Hashem, and even those have to be to a point that affects you. You can almost feel a quiver in your heart or a little bit of an inside uh, sensation, but they don't have an action related to it. Now the Alter Rebbe is going to say, this is where I wanted to start from today, even those mitzvahs that are connected to speech and thought, which are not action necessarily, like learning Torah, saying the blessing after eating, that's a biblical commandment, the bless after you eat. Rikrishma saying the Shema every day is a biblical commandment to say Shema once in the morning, once in the evening. Utfila, the mitzvah saying Amida, to pray every day, that's the Amida. Halkaimalon, we establish, even though we said it here, Lav Kadiridami, the Aini Yetzi de Chavase Behiri Vakavana Levad, Achi Yetzi Bisvasa. We establish a thing that it's not enough to th think in your head, you got to actually verbalize it. And we have in this, uh, this Tanya, this, these two lines here, the Alter Rebbe uses the word v'kaim alon, and we establish it. He says it twice. Once here, we establish that thinking is not enough, we got to say it. V'kaim alon, that kivas vasav havya maisa. And we established that moving your lips are an action. What's he referring to? Why do you say v'kaim alon twice? So there's two different Gemaras that the Alter Rebbe is referring to here, very interesting Gemaras. One is a machlekes amongst the sages in the Talmud. When you say the Shema, you have to say the Shema actually and verbalize it, or you can say the Shema like we read, uh, you know, the ingredients, so we just use our eyes and we think about it. How about if I say the Shema by looking at the words and thinking about it? I'm thinking about um, that we should realize and understand that Hashem is one and all the things he created in the world at different levels of spiritual existence are all part of his oneness. Nothing else exists aside from him. And I think about that. What's, what's, what's the mitzvah? To think about it or to actually just say the words? So the machlekes is, do you have to say the words too? And you have to think about it. Everyone agrees you have to think about it. The machlekes is, you have to say the words too. And the Gemara Paskins, the decision halach is, you have to say the words. Why? Because moving your lips counts as an action. And you have to do a physical action in doing the mitzvah. That's one Gemara. Another Gemara has the argument, a very interesting Gemara. And that is, when it comes to the mitzvah or the, or the negative commandment, that you're forbidden to muzzle your animal when he's in the threshing floor. When an animal comes and works in your field, there are certain times that you're not allowed to muzzle the animal because the animal is working amongst, let's say, grain or corn, and he looks at it and it looks yummy, and you're forbidden to muzzle him. It's tor torture. 
It's like, you know, giving, taking your kid into the dollar store, not buying him some piece of garbage, some piece of junk that, you know, yeah, how could you say no? It's a dollar store. He expects to buy something. You could take him into the kitchen and you're, you're making uh, cookies. You have to give him a cookie. You cannot muzzle the animal. There is an option, of course, to put on a bucket of food separate. That's fine. We can't muzzle him. So the question is like this. What's if a person doesn't muzzle his animal, but he emotionally and mentally messes with the animal that he can't eat? By saying things, every time the animal puts his head down, you scream, you make a noise, you yell something, and the animal can't eat because of your words. Is that also called, because a mitzvah or a sin has to be an action. If somebody thinks about sin, that's not called sin. You could, you could imagine sin all day, you're walking into a place, you're buying a big cheeseburger, you're biting into it. If you didn't do it, it didn't count. But what's if you actually do it? It's a sin. So by the animal, if you muzzle it, and you don't, but not with a physical muzzle, but you basically, it's called verbal abuse. You basically say things to harass the animal that he can't eat. So there's a machlaikis. And the psaktin in the halacha is verbalizing, a, by muzzling by verbal um, action is also considered verbal, is also considered muzzling because moving your lips is an action and you transgress. That's the halacha. So it comes out, two things al is showing us that we find in halacha that using your lips is an action. So when we're learning Torah, or you're in shul at your davening, or you're participating in any sort of Shema, Amida, Talmud Torah, Birchaz Amazin, blessing, you must also say the words because that's called the action, and it draws down the Kedusha actually into this physical world. So you see what is the point? That you see that all of the mitzvahs have to come down into a level of action. Did you say Shema? Uh, yeah, Kishma. Yeah, Shema is a mitzvah from Shema is a mitzvah from the time of. As a matter of fact, there's a story of Yaakov Avinu saying Shema. We know the famous story when Yaakov and Yosef meet. Of he he was saying Shema, but no, no, that that was Baruch Shem. When Yaakov and Yosef meet after being apart 22 years, so it says that ya Yaakov Yosef cried in Yaakov's shoulders. But Yaakov didn't cry back, so he says, "Why not?" He was busy saying Shema. There's a whole discussion. How did he end up saying Shema just at that time? But he was saying the Shema. Shema was being said always. It's a mitzvah of the Teda say Shema. The biblical commandments are Talmud Teda, uh, and Shema. That, these are all actual biblical commandments. Okay. So the any eight say Chevas. Now he goes and explains. But Hayag mitzvah Teda. You want to explain something phenomenal here. You want to explain. There's an advantage not only in Teda Shebek. We said the Teda Shebek Sav was one thing. Mm -hmm. Remember, we divided things up into three levels based on Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya. There's the written Torah, the Mishnah, and, Hal and the, or I said, the written Torah, the logic, and the Halacha. There's the Gemara, the written Torah, and the oral Torah. So what we want to say here now is explain that where do you really find the essence of God? More than the written Torah, you find it in the oral Torah, and more than that, you find it in the Halacha. So that's what we're going to go now and show that this level, just like you have action, which is the Torah has to come down into the world of action. When it comes to Torah, Torah has to come down also, not just in Torah Shebek Sav, also Torah Shebaal Peh and Halacha, in law. So it's not enough just to have the written law, you have to bring it down. Mm -hmm. So he explains, that he yag in mitzvah Torah, in shev in mitzvah the Rabbana, in gimat yu the 613 commandments, and the seven mitzvah the Rabbana, equal the level of Keser. What's the Alter Rebbe trying to tell us? So first of all, let's talk for a second about the seven commandments. Is it a good way uh, to remember it? They say, if you want to remember what the um, uh, seven rabbinic commandments are, the code is na besimcha. I think it's na besimcha. Nun ayin beis sim, sin mem ches hayeh. Na besimcha, nun is netilas um, yadayim. So you have to wash your hands. Ayin is Erevin, the mitzvah of making an Erev, that's from the rabbis. Besimcha, Beis is Bracha. The Bracha we make before meals is rabbinic. After you eat, the Bracha is biblical. You have to make a bless, you have to, mm -hmm. the rabbis set the amount, what's the amount? But after you eat, it's a biblical commandment. Beforehand, the rabbis invented it. You have Beis. Sin is Shabbos. It doesn't mean the mitzvah of Shabbos, it means Shabbos candles. Mem is Megillah, the mitzvah of uh, um, reading, reading the Megillah Purim. Ches is Chanukah, and He is Halal. These are the seven mitzvahs the rabbis added on. 
These are the ones that are not, there are other commandments that rabbis enacted, but those are all hinted to or taken as something from the Torah. These are seven things not hinted to in the Torah, pure inventions of the rabbi, and they become part of it. Why is it so important? It's with these seven that the word tayag becomes keser. What's keser? Keser gets to the advantage of a mitzvah over Torah. What's the difference in mitzvah and Torah? Torah is chachma. Torah is wisdom. Wisdom is found in the head. Keser is a crown. Keser sits above the head. In other words, in the essence of a person, when we talk about the deepest, deepest parts of a person, we usually go after you have action, then you go deeper inside is emotion, deeper inside is my intellect, deeper inside is my ruts and my desire, and deeper is time and pleasure. You have, these are the, the, five, the five powerful levels of our, of our soul. So Ratzin, desire, is higher than Chachma. Because in general, we have two ways that we think and two ways that we want. One way that we think is, we, and we want, is I think something's very good for me. I found it, for example, chia seeds or, or hickory this or, or cinnamon, whatever the food you find out is really good for you. I start wanting it. So why do I want it? I don't really want it. I think and I know about the value of something I want it. I heard about a new way to heat your home with a different type of heater. I want it because I heard about it. Then there are things that that means seichel that brings to chachma. Then you, no, sorry, that means seichel that brings to ratzin. Then you have a much higher ratzin, a ratzin that really I want something, and once I want it, I start thinking about how good it is for me. I want to move to Israel. I want it. Why? I start telling you all the benefits to it, but those really came, really, I just want to live in Israel. It's so the deep desire that I have. All the reasons I'm giving afterwards are true. They're real, but they're coming after this, the Ratzin. Ratzin on the deepest level is a source of mitzvahs. So when someone learns Torah without doing mitzvahs, he has Chachma. He has the head. He, has, he connects to God's Chachma. When someone learns Torah and does mitzvahs, mitzvahs it says a Ratzin Hashem. What's the difference between mitzvahs and Torah? Torah is Hashem's wisdom, which, by the way, is a phenomenal idea. That means Rabbi El Khan, I once read one of his shirim where he explains that when someone learns uh, the seichel, the chachma of the Abishter, two things happen. Number one, you get connected. And he says the same thing, by the way, learning of a Rebbe. He says, he says you, two things happen. By learning his seichel, you connect to him because you start your seichel and his seichel become one. You grasp something that's not Hashem's seichel, Hashem has a trade off, and it's in your mind, it becomes one. But a second thing happens, you start thinking like God. You start seeing the world with God's, God's vision, how Hashem sees the world, meaning you start changing. There's a modification in how you perceive and how you understand. You're affected by the wisdom. Same thing is true of Chassidus. You connect to a rabbi by learning his Chassidus, but then you start seeing and your, your way you see another Jew, the way you see a mitzvah, the way you see an opportunity, the way you get uh, encouraged instead of discouraged is all because you just learn Chassidus and you're, you're, you're changed by the, by the study. But the benefit of the Tariq mitzvah with, with the seven no, uh, rabbinic laws is that it becomes not just Chachma, but it's Keser above Chachma. Okay. Shehurotzein um, Elyon Baruch which that is the Keser refers to Hashem's Ratzein, which is higher than Chachma. Hamolubish b'chachmasa is Baruch. And that way, as it said before, when Ratzein comes first, then Ratzein encloses itself in Chachma. Hashem has a yearning that you should do the mitzvah of Tefillin. You should do the mitzvah of Shabbos candles. You should do the mitzvah of challah. And then when you learn Torah about the laws of challah, about the laws of film, the laws of Shabbos, you're now taking the chachma as it's influenced by Hashem's Ratzin. And then here goes a very beautiful line. And Hashem with chachma, he created the world. What does that mean? Eretz, in addition to meaning the world, also refers to the Tere Shabbal Peh. Why is it Tere Shabbal Peh? It refers to um, Eretz is the area of Ratzin, where we start explaining the... Um, well, let me first let me first say this part. Eretz refers to Tere Shabbal Peh because everything in Tere, while Tere Shabbal is the source, where do you see it? In Tere Shabbal Peh. What does that mean? It says in the Torah, for example, we know there's a mitzvah to fasten Yom Kippur. It doesn't say anywhere in the Torah to fasten Yom Kippur. It says, pain yourself. Maybe it means talking to your mother-in-law. <laughs> Maybe it means have her move in. Maybe it means to look at your electric bill. Maybe it means look at your taxes. Maybe it means um, listen to someone who has a, a vicious, different opinion of, uh, of uh, some act. Meaning, who determines what's called suffering? 
So the Torah Pes says suffering refers to five things: not to eat, not to drink, etc., etc., etc. Same thing tefillin. It says you should have taitafos. You should put um, you should put uh, taitafos as a sign upon your arm and on your head. What is it? What is taitafos? No one knows what it means. It's a mixture of two Greek words. It's this. All that information comes from Torah Shabbat Pes. Same thing in this world. There are many, many powers invested that Hashem gave to this world. But where do you see it come out? Only from the ground. Everything in this world comes from the ground. We see trees, even human beings. We originally came from the earth. Well, everything, the ground, the earth is a source of everything. As a matter of fact, this is why the earth is called Malchus. Malchus is how something is delivered. We said many times that speech is Malchus. Why is speech Malchus? Why it says a king rules by speech. Malchus, kingship, is all Dibur. What's Dibur? Dibur means I have something inside of me. And someone else doesn't know what that is. It could be anger, it could be love, it could be wisdom, it could be foolishness. Whatever I have, until I share it by verbalizing it, the other person doesn't know. That's what Hashem created the world. Hashem had within him kindness. Hashem had within him all different spheres. And Dibur means he spoke and projected that into an existing world. So this is the definition of, of so Machas represents that which is being expressed by the previous levels with this midrash or seichel into the world and that's what eretz is eretz is the place where all vegetation everything comes out all the powers of things that were existing before they didn't see it are revealed through the earth okay he which he says is which comes from the highest level of chachma like it says in zayar the abba yisad brata that Abba is the foundation of Brata, means a daughter. What does this mean? In general, the mitzvah of, well, let's say one, let's say one thing first. The father and a daughter, it's brought down, have a special relationship. Even though naturally you'd think a daughter would get along with a mother, particularly the same, but it's brought down that for whatever reason, a daughter feels a certain kinship, a certain connection to the father. And there's reasons, I'll be um, Kabbalah, you know, there's a reason that says if the father is Masriya Tchila, is Yelda Nekeva. If the father's seed comes first, it's a, it's a Nekeva. But also, Kabbalistically, there's a connection with the father and the daughter, which biologically comes in a certain relationship that a, a bond that a father and daughter could have. It's unique. Doesn't mean it's always going to be there, but it's a very beautiful thing, the relationship that can be there uh, to consult, to confide, etc. On a spiritual level, it means that Chachma expresses itself particularly in Malchus. Where do you see the ultimate expression of Chachma? And as you know, Malchus is Dibur. Where do, if you want to know where is wisdom expressed in speech, the ultimate place where you can express wisdom is speech. But um, what he's referring here to, Malchus is the earth. Malchus is an earth, we said, the first Teresh of Alpeh. Where do you see the true expression of Hashem's wisdom is specifically in Teresh of Alpeh, which of course is the lower worlds of Asiya. Yeah, these three lines are quite uh, deep in Kabbalah. But the, the point is, as a matter of fact, it says that um, the mitzvah of having a family is the mitzvah of a, a family creates Hashem's name. We know Yud is Chachma's father. Hey is Bina, the mother. Vav is the middah, the son, the six middays, is the, a, a male boy. And Malchus is a female child, meaning the, the family structure. And when a family gets along, it shows, what does it mean when you have a family getting along, Shalom bias, that it's a good thing. It's not just a husband and wife. It's the whole family, because then Hashem is in the home complete. You know, we, we take sometimes a Yudke Vavke as a nice, sweet things, but they're they're profound in its effect of our our connecting to Hashem is the aspect of a father and a mother and a son daughter get along. That is Hashem's name is complete. The Balshem, I think we spoke about this a long time ago, a couple of years ago. The Balshem once told us Chassidim that he once explained to them how really Hashem's name is found in every mitzvah. And he said, what's Yud Kei Vav Kei in the midst of Tzedakah? That a person takes his a coin, which is a little dot to Yud. You put it in your hand, which has five fingers of hey. You stretch out your hand, which is a Vav. And you put it into the hand of a poor person. That's Yud Kei Vav Kei. It's Hashem's name. So in every mitzvah, we can explain how you see the Yud Kei Vav Kei. So this is the, the connection of the highest level of godliness coming down to the lowest level of Eretz into Malchus, into the Halacha. So just to finish this point, we're going now to the next and final section of Tanya. To explain this point simply is that Hashem did the impossible. He took the greatest 
of the highest, loftiest essence of himself, and he injects it in the lowest part of existence of Toyota, and it's the actions of physical. Now imagine, if there's a part of Toyota that my mind can understand, imagine how distant that is from the essence of Toyota. Because just take for an example, we use example many times, Einstein. When Einstein wants to share something with a kid, imagine how little of what he's sharing with the kid, the kid and the kid can understand it. The kid doesn't understand it. You know, a lot of times I remember in yeshiva, the t- teacher said something in Gemara. I have no idea what he said, but I can repeat it. I have no idea what he's talking about, but I can say it over. And that's because I don't know what he's talking about. Repeating something, no problem. That's what we said. That's the benefit of Teresh HaBiksav. Teresh HaBiksav means I have to understand it too. My mind got to grasp it. That's the beauty of Teresh I have to understand it. Otherwise, it doesn't count as learning. Imagine how small of the information in Einstein's head is being transmitted when a kid can understand it. Now magnify that a couple of billion times. Hashem's wisdom that a human being can understand. Imagine how small that is. Nevertheless, it's never lost its undiluted power. And this is the blessing and the impossible miracle of Torah that we have today in our world. That Hashem took the great essence of himself, injected it, like it says, Anoichi, the first word of Ten Commandments, is Ano, Nafshi, Ksavis, Yehavis. I, my soul, I'm writing, I'm putting myself, God says, into the letters. And when some little boy chick is learning Chumash in class, he's bringing down the essence of Hashem unfiltered, but it doesn't pop his brain, God forbid, because it's Hashem at the same time allows himself, like the uh, elephant through the eye of the needle, he allows himself to go through and make it through the needle gently. The needle doesn't feel any discomfort. It makes it right in and doesn't have to stretch. It's comfortable because the elephant didn't change in size, but Hashem made it fit comfortably inside the eye of the needle. And that's the miracle of Teda that we learned today. And with that introduction, the al Rebbe can answer his question that he asked three chapters ago. He wanted to understand a certain question. He brought a story of a very fascinating story of that little boy, Hayyanuka, the son of Rabbi Hamanuna. Whole fascinating story. We spoke about it uh, a couple of months ago that there was uh, two sages that visited the home of Hamanuna, and there was a little child there. And the child, before he teaches them this very profound insight, they had a question in Taita. He he tells them some very interesting line, and he says that the the what does it mean that a person shouldn't walk four cubits? Uh, without a yarmulke, without a head covering, because the shechina is on his head. And he says, the shechina is the fl- the fire, the flame that's on that person's head. And the wick is the person, and the oil is the good deeds. The Alter Rebbe is bothered by this. And that's what we spoke about, a whole thing we spoke about a few months ago. The Alter Rebbe is bothered. What do you mean the oil is the good deed? We have been, for the last, all the years that we studied Torah, we know one thing. Um. Oil is Torah. Oil is oil is Chachma. We always said it that you want to you want to get rich. Uh, you turn to the back of the Shulchan, which was um, to one side when you daven. You want to get smart in Torah. Turn to the uh, direction of the Menorah. The Menorah is Torah. Torah the light. Torah 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 is light. Since when is Torah Chachma? Uh, since when is Shemen good deeds and not just good deeds? He says good deeds, he means physical good deeds, of them, things that you do physically. He didn't say good deeds like, you know, uh, saying the Shema. He says that where do you feed and how do you connect to that Shekhinah at the top of your head? With the Shemen, he says, is the physical body or the, or the vital soul. That is part of the animal soul. The animal soul, if you remember, has three parts. It's the animal soul, the vital soul, and the natural soul, known as Nefesh Bahamas. Nefesh Achienis and Nefesh Ativis. The Nefesh Achienis, or the person, that's, the, that's your biological soul. And what keep, what's the electricity in your body? What keeps you alive? Nefesh Achienis. That is, the, doing a mitzvah with that feeds the Shechina. He says, why is that called Shemin? Shemin is always referred to Torah. We know on Hanukkah, we're going to come to Hanukkah soon. We're going to have the whole thing was the Greeks wanted to, they wanted to be metame. They wanted to make impure our Shemin, our oil. What does that mean? They wanted to make our Torah shouldn't be holy. We have no problem with learning Torah, but it shouldn't be holy. It shouldn't be pure. Let it be like any other wisdom. We're big philosophers. The Greeks, we had Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. We had all the geniuses, all the, all the philosophers. We also have Chachma. So Torah is another Chachma. We love it. But get rid of this whole spiritual part. So here, the Altadev is bothered. Why is he using Shemin to refer to good deeds? And we'll start with this. Then we'll finish the chapter next week. This is about the young boy, this brilliant spiritual child, says, the Nahida Ila, this fire above, which is on top of our head, the Adlik Al which sits on our heads, he shinta. 
And this, by the way, explains what does it mean? Chacham ene bereshay. It says that is the the um, wise person. His eyes are on his head. So sometimes we explain it. His eyes on his head. Where do you think his eyes are? And a foolish person's on his elbow. You know, the smart guys they put the eyes here. The foolish people it's on their elbow. It's on the back of their shoulders. They can't see where they're going. They bump into things. So the, the Gemara explains eyes on a head means I, I see the future. I see the result of what I'm going to do now. Meaning I look ahead and I see if I eat this now, I'll have a tummy ache later. Or if I do this sin now, it's going to cost me later. If I work hard, do the mitzvah, it benefits me. But Chassidus takes it a step further. What does that mean? His eyes are on his head because he's looking the whole time towards the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is there. Your eyes are on your head, meaning it doesn't mean your eyes are in your head. Your eyes are on your head. My eyes are on you. I'm watching it. So what does that mean? My eyes are on the Shekhinah. So the Yunukah said, because the, the fire, the Shekhinah sits on your head. He says, it's to the, I wanted to explain what did this boy, this little child of Rabbi Manuna say? It's to it needs oil, pirish, to enclose itself in chachma, which is called the oil of the anointing. Now, by the way, this is fascinating. It says, I, I saw this somewhere, I heard this, that when you're learning something and one thing, and it's the same thing of that day's study for one of the daily studies we do. It's a sign from Hashem as a blessing. Today we'll learn the mitzvah of the day is the law of the Shem and Hamishcha that you make to anoint the Kayan Gadol. And here he talks about it. Here he says, that's the mitzvah of the day. Hanikra Shem and Mishcha's Kaydish. It's called the oil of anointing. So this oil of anointing, the, this Yenukah that says, you're, the Shekhinah needs that oil. Like it says in Zahar, what is it? The Inun Uvdin Tavin, it means the good deeds. So that why does the Yenukah tell us that this is the good deeds? So why is it called the Chachma? Why is it called Shemen? Now we understand. Based on what we just said, that specifically in the good deeds is where is found the Chachma of the Kesser of Chachma Ilah, is found in the actual Halacha, in the actions. Now we can understand what the Yenukah was saying. You know how you know how the shechina sustains itself. You know how it. You know how the shechina sustains itself in your body is when you do good deeds. And our question was, why good deeds? Torah. What's Torah? Torah is chachma. But where do you have the strongest dose of the chachma of Torah? How it expresses itself in the good deeds that you do in the mitzvahs ma'aseis, because it has the benefit of keser as expressed in chachma, etc. So the, what we tried these three chapters that we just had explaining this whole idea of how one place can have more sanctity than another, how can Hashem Shekhinah be one place? Now that we understand what Shekhinah is, and now we understand what Torah is, where is Torah expressed most in the actions and the halacha that we do? And when someone does a physical action, it draws down the Shekhinah, draws down Torah in its strongest, most powerful way. And that's what the Yenukah was saying. That's what the young child was telling to these two rabbis that came into his home, that they came to visit. And then he, of course, teaches them the primary teaching that they came for. This all is expressed and uh, uh, is experienced specifically through our physical actions of doing a mitzvah. So just a point to take everything we said, meaning from the entire Tanya before we go to the last point, basically what we're saying is ultimately, the ultimate way to draw down God's derbatachtenim, to draw down mm-hmm. God in this physical word, world, is when we do a mitzvah, of course, infused with feeling, with awe, with love and fear of, and awe of God, but we do the mitzvah in this physical action in the lowest form possible. Not just that we do it because we understand what's lower than what's what's greater than understanding, meaning what's coming down even lower, not because I understand. So, meaning why at the end of the day am I doing the mitzvah? Not because of the wisdom, not because it makes sense to me, because Hashem said so. That means I'm doing it. The lowest part of the person is called bittel. I'm doing it not because I understand. I do understand. I know why you want me to do it. Imagine you you listen to a parent or a commanding officer or someone older than you, and you say, I'm doing it. Even though it makes sense to me, that's why I'm doing it, because you asked me to do it. In other words, a much greater putting self aside. I'm tapping into the lowest part of myself, meaning it's complete vital. I'm acting low. I'm not using my seichel. I'm not using my emotions. I'm, I'm using those too. But that's all based on my vital, my lowest part of myself that I'm doing because you said so, without my understanding. And this is what draws down Hashem into the dear B'dachtayim, into this world in the strongest form. To explain this properly a little bit more, next week we'll conclude the Tanya. We'll um, have to have everyone to prepare a little something to eat because whenever we finish a large study of Torah, we should do it with a, a, a sium. So next week, we'll do the last 15, 20 lines of Tanya, concluding the 53 chapters and about eight or nine years of study. And we'll start, God willing, a fresh start right after Yudas Kislev. So looking forward to seeing everyone next week. It would be a very uh, good source of nachas to Hashem that we um, 
did this uh, study. Wow. And um, if you have a part of it, if you're all of it, you're all part of the celebration. Um, it's it's because um, even those of us like myself, who I actually came to all the classes, but um, <laughs> there's a lot more I can understand that I don't understand. So so um, we also learned part of it. Anyway, looking forward to seeing everybody next week. And that will be um, next Wednesday is the 13th. Oh, that's a good day. We'll talk about it. The 13th of Kislev is a good day on the Chabad calendar. As the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, the whole month. Is. <laughs> but, but this one is packed with good deeds. And Hashem should bless all of us to have good health and nachas and happiness and continue learning. Amen. Thank you.